Hi, my name is Dan McLucas. As Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Health and Ageing, I'm pleased to introduce this satellite broadcast produced by the Rural Health Education Foundation, which focuses on smoking and pregnancy. As many of you would be aware, the detrimental effects of smoking on fertility, pregnancy and the health of the baby are well documented. Yet even now, approximately one in six Australian women and one in two Indigenous women smoke during their pregnancy. The situation is even more critical in rural and remote areas, where the rates of smoking during pregnancy are much greater than in the major cities. This is a major public health concern, which this government takes very seriously. The Commonwealth Government is committed to reducing the rate of smoking amongst pregnant women and mothers, and has provided $4.3 million to the three-year Smoking and Pregnancy Initiative, which is funding this broadcast. The aim of the broadcast is to encourage greater support for women, particularly Indigenous women, to reduce smoking during and after pregnancy. Smoking during pregnancy reduces the growth and health of babies and increases the number of complications and illness. Babies born to women who smoke during pregnancy have a greater chance of premature birth. The likelihood of preterm birth is 60% higher. They have lower birth weight. In fact, babies who, of mothers who smoke are twice as likely to be of low birth weight. There are more still, stillbirths and a higher rate of infant mortality. As you can see, there is great scope for improving the health of mothers and babies if smoking rates can be reduced. Health professionals play an absolutely essential role in delivering good care and support for women before, during and after pregnancy. But they can do more to help reduce the rate of smoking during pregnancy. There is solid evidence that pregnant women may be more motivated to quit at this time, when the risks are discussed with them in a clinical setting and when they are supported by a GP or a midwife. This broadcast will assist GPs practice nurses, midwives and Aboriginal health workers, particularly for those who work and live in rural and remote areas, to, to provide that support. It contains up-to-date, evidence-based information on smoking intervention services and care. I commend this broadcast as a key tool in improving Australia's performance on this important health issue. I strongly believe that better understanding of the risks of smoking will lead to improved pregnancy outcomes for women throughout Australia. Hello, I'm Robin Swan. Welcome to this program on smoking and pregnancy. As Senator McLucas indicated, while Australia now has the fourth lowest smoking prevalence in the world, we still have one in six women smoking in pregnancy. And in Indigenous communities, the rates of smoking in pregnancy are much higher, around 50%. There are also particular concerns with young mothers. While pregnancy remains one of the strongest motivators for quitting, some mothers still have real difficulties. Primary health care professionals such as you have a key role to play in encouraging and supporting women to quit and staying stopped after the birth of their babies. And that, also, that role also extends to their partners and family members because if you're smoking, if you're living in a household with other smokers, it's pretty hard to stay quit. In this program, we'll look at some of the major initiatives around the country to see just how health professionals can make a difference. We're coming to you live across Australia through the Rural Health Education Foundation satellite network. And as usual, there are a number of useful resources available for you on the Rural Health Education Foundation's website, rhef.com.au. And I'll introduce our panel to you. We've got Kate Strasser, who's a general practitioner from Altona in Victoria, and a former advisor to Quit Victoria, She's also currently an advisor to SANE Australia regarding smoking cessation in people with schizophrenia. Welcome, Kate. Thank you. One of the causes of very premature mortality amongst people with schizophrenia. Correct. We think about all the other drugs, but not their smoking. That's right. And yes. presumably in w women who are pregnant with schizophrenia as well. Yes. Sue Hendy is a clinical midwifery consultant at Nepean Hospital in New South Wales and a representative of the Australian College of Midwives on the National Smoking and Pregnancy Advisory Group. Welcome, Sue. Thank you, Norman. What does that group do? 
That group was the group that was tasked to look at the um, federal funding and how it could be best served to implement a project to um, support smoking cessation in pregnancy and beyond. And so some of the materials we're going to look at here you've had an influence over? Yes. Yeah. And you've worked in Cairns as well as New South Wales and yes. with Indigenous communities? Yes. Raoul Walsh is a researcher at the Centre for Health Research and Psycho-Oncology at the University of Newcastle. He and his colleagues have produced some significant findings on smoking and pregnancy. Welcome Raoul. Pleased to be here. What sort of work have you done? Well, particularly um, uh, major clinical trials in public hospital antenatal clinics trying to evaluate uh, programs that might encourage women to stop smoking. That, that's probably what we're best known for. But we've also looked at uh, doctors and nurses' attitudes and approaches in the area as well and, and documented some deficits in, in the areas of training and motivation. Such as? Well, we found uh, that uh, only about a quarter of uh, doctors and nurses felt they had sufficient skills to undertake smoking cessation. This, this is research we undertook in the mid-90s. And about half thought they needed more training. So it's clear that uh, some of the programs we'll hear about tonight are, are, are needed for healthcare providers to really get them involved in the area and get them past the stage of, of just asking about smoking and doing nothing more. Right, although just asking about smoking does have a measurable effect. Well, a brief intervention. Uh, we probably need to do a little bit more than You're ask. A brief intervention. A little city. bit more. That's a bit too brief. Uh, we probably need to give a bit <coughs> of risk information and a tiny bit, at least, of counselling and encouragement to get get an effect. And presumably, when you're talking about young Aboriginal women, Sue, you're talking about an awful lot more than that. You certainly are. Yeah. We also hope to have Vicky Briggs of the Centre of, Excell of Excellence in Indigenous Tobacco Control here tonight, but she's unwell, unfortunately, and unable to cont attend. And we wish her well. Let's go to our first case study about Rothana and Samantha, two Indigenous mothers, and they're talking to Kay Thompson of the Townsville Aboriginal and Islander Health Service about quitting. Good morning, ladies. I'd just like to welcome you here to Mums and Babies, Townsville Aboriginal and Islander Health Service. Um, today we're just going to discuss about our smoking program and introduce you to Susie. And Susie's got a 24-week baby, so now she's going to have a cigarette. Now Susie's drawing her cigarette in. See how the water's gone a bit dirty. Mm -hmm. Oh my god, that is so bad. That's going into your baby. I'd just like to ask you a few questions. How are you going with your smoking? Have you been able to quit? Um, well, I'm currently not smoking anymore. I quit when I was four, three or four months pregnant. It was hard, but yeah, I haven't smoked since. You just don't like think of it anymore. And you, with them? Well, I continue smoking. I slowed down through the program, but as um, the pregnancy, finishing up the pregnancy, I continued smoking. It was just too much for me to take on. It's quitting smoking and having a four-year-old and then having a newborn and it was just, the pressure was just too much. In your family at home, did you have any other smokers around you? No, I was the only one that smoked at home. You were? And it was like a time for me to be away from everything, you know, go and have a cigarette and a coffee. It was your time And that out. was my time out from everyone. Yeah. I have slowed down. I've now changed my eating habits and becoming healthy, going for walks, and it has slowed me down. Okay. Well, we were actually living with um, my partner's parents, and um, they were very heavy smokers. Like, but my partner actually quit with me. He went and got the patches, and I was on the gum. So he used to smoke a lot. Like, we used to go through $140 a week on two cartons of cigarettes. Yeah, I first started smoking when I was on Palm Island as a teenager and the only cigarettes that we could get and as adults now is um, strong milligram smoke, 16s and 12 milligrams and that's all they sell. There's no um, low milligram only when you come to the mainland um, and that also happens up in the Torres Strait as well in their shops but it's always been like that, always. 
my advice to other girls, I know like when you're smoking and you fall pregnant, it is the hardest thing to do. It is so hard because you have to quit like that because you know you're pregnant for nine months, you just got to quit. Um, go to like go to someone that can help you. Don't you can't just quit like that. You have to talk about it. Know what's right and wrong. What what you're actually doing to your child if you continue to smoke, what you're doing to yourself, and it's not a good habit. And the support that you got from Townsway Aboriginal and Islander Our Service, did you feel it helped in any way? The support from here was really good. You put, not pressure, but it was just telling us, telling the, us truth, the truth, yeah. the realisation of the truth, yeah. and but you were there to support, it wasn't a pushing you know, you need to quit, you need to quit. It was, yeah. we're here to help you. Yeah. Yeah. And I knew where there was support um, that was going to help me if it was a time that I was going to quit altogether. I don't think I would have quit if you guys didn't help me. People from Townsville Aboriginal and Islanders Health Service. Um, Sue, that shows a lot of the complexity that sits behind there. I mean, these women are under pressure, enormous pressure, to smoke and keep smoking. Mm. Yes, and uh, as we've seen from the figures, the prevalence in the Aboriginal communities are ex extreme. In New South Wales, there was an increase from 58 to 78 per cent um, related to smoking when we introduced a strategy in which the women were connected with midwives and health workers and actually reported their true smoking figures. So 50 per cent is an underestimate. It's, it is, yes. Yeah. It's, it's more like yes. three out of four. Yes. Do we know the causes? Do we know the reasons why women smoke? It is multifactorial um, and it is historical and policy and political, but it is also the fact that they often live in out overcrowded situations with multiple people smoking, they've had multiple stresses and not the support and the connection with some of the health services to support them to give up smoking. Can I mention one thing that I think was brought out particularly was the woman who talked about having a smoke as being time out and this is mm. something that's very common with people with smoke and particularly um, mothers with young kids to be able to go separate themselves and yes. have time out and so it's important to address that. So in other words you can have a chat with the girls without necessarily smoking? That's right yeah. but it may be just time out by yourself often for mothers. Um, I know women who will only smoke outside the home um, so they'll go outside and that's their time by themselves and so you if they're going to stop smoking, you have to help them work out what are they going to do instead of that to have their time out. And of course, we, we can't underrate the addiction component. I mean, that yes. is a really crucial factor here. Uh, Sorry, the which component? The, the addiction, yes. the dependence on nicotine. And uh, often that can be confused too with stress release. Uh, many smokers will say they smoke yes. to cope with yeah. stress and, and sure, that's part of it, but they often are confusing stress with uh, withdrawal control. symptoms yes. and uh, they're actually dealing with the stress of withdrawal as much. Yes. As so one of the case. strategies is to give them insight into people insight into their symptoms. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and but but mm -hmm. presumably one of the um, things that are sitting in the back of say a health professionals, whether it's an Aboriginal health worker or a nurse or a GP, when you're dealing with somebody who is heavily addicted to nicotine but living in difficult circumstances, whether it be somebody with schizophrenia, whether it be somebody in an indigenous community, is that unless you correct the social environment that people are living in, how do you get them off their cigarettes? Is that a realistic concern to have or you know, we can, you, you, you don't, you know, the two are not necessarily as connected as people would like to think? Well, I think it's a reasonable concern uh, but Obviously a clinician can only do so much in, in an interaction with a patient and I think they, they have to concentrate uh, at least in substantial part on the things that they can do with the patient mm. and, their, and their social environment if their family or friends or partner are with them. But um, sure, they, they may contribute to things that are going to change the broader social mm. environment but in that interaction with the patient that, you know, they've really got to concentrate on and, what and they can do, do and with do that what patient you can. at that time. And of course, um, the quit rate in the general community, you know, people try five times. So I mean, it's not as if you mm. expect to be successful first time. That's right. It, it does seem to be a process where people seem to get, need to go through a number of, of tries at it. And uh, something tips them over the edge on a try and, mm. and people will often nominate, well, this thing or that thing really 
got me mm. there that time. So you mentioned when you asked the right question, you got uh, you know, a 50% increase mm. in the smoking rates and to the true level. Mm. I noticed there that Kay was asking, asked quite in a quite deliberate way about their smoking. I mean, just to remind you, I mean, she said something like, how are you going with your smoking rather, mm. rather than any other question. Is, is that quite important? It is important. I mean, a trusting relationship with your clinician uh, care provider situation is really important, particularly for Aboriginal people if you're not Aboriginal. The other thing is that uh, it needs to be supportive, not punitive. Women know what it's doing to them often and, and perhaps need some more education around the baby. But um, they don't need us to be punitive about us. They, they need us to be quite direct in our questioning, but supportive in, in the way in which we teach them to or support them to give up. And I, I, I was sorry. just going to say, it's best to start, if you can, and if you've got time with an open-ended question, as in the video, mm -hmm. rather than, uh, are you smoking? Uh, mm -hmm. A yes-no right. question is more likely to promote um, a socially desirable answer. They think you want you to say, you, you know, you're please. expected to say no, so they'll say no. And I think another important question is, how do you feel about it? Because that helps the clinician to direct mm -hmm the appropriate Get amount the of support um, as to whether they're ready or, or they actually are not ready. Yeah. Because some people enjoy it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, much as we but the other thing is if you're asking about whether they're a smoker and they say no, ask have they ever smoked and how long since you smoked yes. because it may be that they stopped a week ago and they might be in, uh, in need of help at that time. And also a misconception about light cigarettes Yes, there. actually I was going to mm. say, I don't know, with the rum, mm. you mm. know, something about the well, low tar. Is well, the evidence is pretty clear that low tar has been a bit of a scam. Mm. <laughs> Promoted and in fact, there's some indications that you actually get worse cancer with it because you suck mm. deeper into yes, the more right. peripheral. Yes. Compensatory yes. smoking yes. and so on. That's one of the risks too with reducing the number of cigarettes you smoke. Unless you reduce an awful lot and are conscious of the compensatory mechanisms that uh, the gains are often illusory. Mm. And I've got a question here from North Queensland. What are the best ways to convey the effects of smoking in pregnancy to uh, women? Sue or Kate or anybody? Um, <laughs> I think it depends on who it is you're trying to convey to and um, I mean, Sue, you were saying earlier that uh, amongst Aboriginal people there are very different cultures within the, the, mm. the, the Aboriginal people. And um, Can, I, can mm. I just say, I think you've got to know your target audience and what their needs are, um, whether it be Aboriginal, non-English speaking or whoever it might be, the mentally um, ill people. And so I think um, the questions that we might talk about a bit later on in how we ask those questions and assess um, as long as you know your target audience and you've s sought information from them and they mm -hmm. sort of will guide you as to how to approach that different group. Often just asking the person what's your understanding of mm -hmm. the effect that the smoking is having is a good place to start and then you can build on what they know or the misinformation mm -hmm. that they've yes. got. Yeah. Which is and a question from Rural Victoria, um, general practitioner there, are there forms of nicotine replacement therapy that are better than others to use in pregnancy, Kate? Um, well, this is one of the big myths here that you're not allowed to use. That that's it's not right. Safe. That's right. And in fact, um, as in most things in medicine, you often have to balance the the risk against the benefits. And um, I don't actually. You might have more information, Ral, about this, but I don't think the the method. They say that episodic uh, nicotine replacement is better than 24 hour. Mm. From the from There's the There's a little bit of, of evidence that uh, continuous. Um, absorption of nicotine could wouldn't be as, could as, be as a problem yes. with fetal development, yes. but, uh, I think but it's it's a very tentative finding at this stage. Yes. There have been, I think, a number of laboratory studies, and uh, only one of them showed a, a, a minor uh, problem. Um, mostly, they didn't show any adverse. Mm -hmm. Short -term but there's a belief out there that you can't use nicotine mm. replacement in pregnant women, and that's just mm. simply not true. Is that right? That's correct. It's really it. It may be what's important. To I guess there's a few issues here. One is um, the latest recommendations with nicotine replacement are that the woman actually takes the patch off overnight. You wouldn't smoke 24 hours a day and so they're asked to take the patch off for eight of the 24 hours. There are a lot of uh, controversy around nicotine replacement and as a member of the National Advisory Group of Smoking Pregnancy this was discussed very early on. Um, recently I had a lady in, in an antenatal clinic and um, she reported to the doctor and she's had previous small babies, is in a high risk clinic 
and reported to the doctor she was smoking 30, so uh, the obstetrician asked me to see the lady. When I sat and, and asked her in a very supportive way how she, how she was going, she actually admitted to me she was smoking 45 a day and had had several quit attempts. Her partner had given up everything, was looking good. So I went out to speak to the obstetrician because uh, she had done everything else. And it so she replacement. the extra percentage yes. help that NRT would give shouldn't, mm. shouldn't be used as a first line, but mm. after uh, the, the, the woman has exhausted everything else. Unfortunately, when we looked on the pharmaceutical um, website, the uh, nicotine replacement is still a category D, which is contraindicated in pregnancy. <coughs> it is supposed to have been moved into the um, cautious um, uh, part of the um, pharmacopoeia, and um, the doctor would not write her up for NRT. So I sought guidance actually from um, the national advisor, the national coordinator, Deb Ogue, and she suggested I contact the local pharmacy for the woman, and the woman then went to access NRT, and I'm following her up on a very regular basis by phone um, with her consent, and she sees me in clinic, and she's now had two weeks without a cigarette. So I think, you know, there are ways in which we need to get the message out here. Um, it is my understanding that um, certain companies have been out there and tried to get the message out, but clinicians need to be very up to date with nicotine replacement. And they are going to change that categorisation, I understand. Yes, I, I did um, discuss it with Canberra and they uh, are working on that. I was going to say, there's only been one big trial of, of nicotine replacement therapy in pregnancy and regrettably, it, there was, well, it didn't show an advantage for NRT over uh, not prescribing NRT, but what happened in the trial at um, there were very high quit rates in both groups, as often happens in controlled trials. <laughs> and uh, whilst there was no significant difference in quit rates, th there was a significant increase in birth weight in the women that used NRT. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a bit of a mixed finding. Right. Uh, and, and, and whilst it's marketed as, a, as the magic thing, it really only increased the relative risk of quitting by about 10%, doesn't it? It's yeah. part of the, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, it's, yeah. but when it's you've got somebody seriously addicted, bullet. this is mm. a, yeah. That's for sure. And you're not allowed to use propropion, presumably. No. Sorry, the other thing I want to just comment on, but everybody, I think, watching would know this, is that really we're not just talking about the antenatal period. Mm -hmm. We're talking about staying quitted for the, staying off cigarettes for the sake of yourself and your child mm. beyond, aren't we, Kate? That's right, that's right. And um, uh, so we're looking at, at after the child has been born and um, that's terribly important because I think we know that um, there is a certain quit rate of people during pregnancy but um, there's also a relapse rate of people taking up smoking again once the child is born. Yes, so we that, need to, to And that's fairly up. depressing in, in uh, the uh, US studies, uh, particularly that look, have looked at this uh, at six months post-birth, uh, post um, something like half to uh, two-thirds have relapsed. Mm. And so that's cr clearly a critical area for us to address, to, to continue to focus and talk with women about the benefits for them and for the baby in mm. terms of SIDS and so on as well. So if you look across the spectrum, Raul, and you look at your research and that of others, what do we know works and doesn't work at each stage here? Well, we know that um, most encouragingly, uh, advice from a midwife or a doctor works. So that's, that's important to know. Um, we, there aren't a lot of other things that we actually do know work. Self-help materials do help a little bit, particularly if they're tailored to the target population well. But uh, a lot of other things that have been tried, there's either insufficient evidence or no ev evidence. And that's things like feedback methods, for example, showing ultrasounds, early technology, uh, use of that didn't produce uh, you know, an effect. Uh, things like hypnosis haven't been shown to have an effect. Um, so really the main thing that we've got good evidence for is doctor and midwife advice at this stage. In RTs, uh, that one trial was encouraging in terms of birth weight, but not in terms of quit, so. Sue, so, who should do it? Um, I believe that midwives are best placed to be able to provide the support in collaboration with GPs where there are GPs and obstetricians when we work in high risk clinics with women and in the community. But um, at the moment with an increasing birth rate in, um, in Australia and a national shortage of midwives, our system is under a lot of pressure and our models don't support us doing anything but 
providing you know, screening and assessment and advice during a routine antenatal visit. But why not Aboriginal health workers? Oh, sorry, Aboriginal health workers within their own communities, but all of these clinicians need to be actually educated and trained in smoking cessation, smoking um, support and intervention in best practice, whether it's in an Aboriginal community, a GP surgery or a public antenatal clinic. Can someone who smokes tell somebody else to give up? I think um, I've been involved with the New South Wales Aboriginal Maternal Infant Health Strategy and we educated midwives and health workers to um, to support Aboriginal women to give up smoking during pregnancy and 70% of Aboriginal health workers it's estimated do smoke and um, the, the uh, education was to enable them to use their uh, experience as a smoker to, to provide that advice, but it was also targeted to try and get them to give up smoking as well. And there's some community controlled uh, Aboriginal medical services we're getting really good at. Um, Absolutely, yes. I think in Western Australia they've banned smoking within Aboriginal medical services, yeah. and all, all government funded services, so things are moving ahead there. I, I, th what, I thought that that doll um, thing there uh, was a bit patronising, mm. uh, but maybe that's just me. What do you think? Sue? I think as a person who's um, taught uh, Aboriginal health workers for a long time and has worked in Aboriginal communities, Aboriginal people, and you have to remember that, that what might work up in the Torres Strait or in Cairns or Townsville certainly um, may not work in other Aboriginal communities. Because of huge diversity in Indigenous communities. Because of the diversity in Aboriginal culture. But my understanding with working with Aboriginal um, health workers and, and communities are they are very visual people, they like um, things that give them a very graphic um, look at what actually things are doing and also it debunks some of the myths that they have um, you know, carried through about some uh, things like smoking and pregnancy. What do you think the toughest thing is for a GP in that situation, particularly if you've got Aboriginal patients, Kate? Uh, well, I haven't had much experience with Aboriginal patients. I think the, the main thing for a GP is the relationship that they have with the patient and having some understanding of where the patient is coming from so that you can personalise any um, advice that you give, any sort of assistance. Which is where GPs who work closely with Aboriginal communities have an advantage because they have Aboriginal health workers and community that they can that's call right. upon. That's right, that's right. Let's go to our second case study. And in fact, Kate stars in this. She's talking to a smoker who's just had her pregnancy confirmed. Kate, as you're about to see, uses the 5A framework and the stage of change model and intervention with this woman. Let's take a look. Well, Jodie, just as we thought, you are eight weeks pregnant. Congratulations. Oh, that's great. Thanks. Now, a few things I need to check with you. Are you a smoker? Uh, yes, I am, actually. And how many do you smoke a day? Uh, 25 cigarettes a day. Mm-hmm. And how long have you been a smoker? Uh, ten years or so. Have you ever tried to quit? No, not really. Okay. Well, it's important that you do understand that smoking is harmful for you and for your baby. Now that you're pregnant, have you thought about cutting down or trying to quit? No, I, I haven't really thought about it and I don't think I'd want to quit at the moment. I mean, this, this baby you know, is pretty stressful and I think it'd make mm. me more stressed. Mm. Look, it, it may be difficult, but there are certainly problems for your baby. Well, I mean, I have heard that, but I've had other friends who have smoked while they were pregnant and, and their babies were fine. Well, I'm glad to hear that, but um, there still is a risk to your baby. I'm not sure that you're aware that smoking actually means that your baby's being starved of some oxygen in terms of its development. Yeah, but cigarettes help me cope. I just don't think I could quit at the moment. A lot of people do find it stressful, but it's important to think about other ways of managing that stress apart from smoking. And I am concerned about you. I mean, now that you're pregnant and your life is going to be different, it's actually an opportunity to make some changes. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll think about it. What I'd like you to do is to take this book with you. I know you're not interested just at the moment, but I hope that you might actually think about what we've discussed and it may be that in the future you'd like to make some changes and I'd certainly be very happy to talk to you about those. OK, thanks. All right. Now, with respect to your nutrition, how are you eating at the moment? Jodie, I'm glad to say that your blood pressure is quite normal. <laughs> Okay, good, thanks. Now, have you thought any more about smoking since last we met? Um, yeah, well, I, I did think about it. I actually had a couple of goes at sort of trying to cut down, 
but it's still really hard to quit. Mm, well, good on you for trying. What have you tried? Um, well, I tried not to smoke while I was in the car, and, and that was OK, but I still don't know what to do when I'm stressed. Yes, I understand that it can be difficult for you, but I am glad that you've tried to cut back on your smoking because stopping smoking is the best thing that you can do for your health and for that of your baby. Do you think you could have another go at cutting down? It is your decision and it's got to be you that makes that decision. Um, yes, well, I, yeah, I think I could give another go. Good on you. What I've found with most people is that it, it really is a matter of trial and error to work out what works for them in terms of what they're going to do if they're not smoking. So think about things that you can do when you'd normally smoke, perhaps like ringing a friend or listening to some music, something like that. Oh, OK. Well, um, yes, those things might work. I know it seems difficult for you at the moment, but I'm very glad that you've given it some thought. And if there's anything I can do to support you in quitting, please let me know. OK, thanks. Kate Strasser, um, with one of your patients. A typical patient or, um, you know, how... <laughs> no, very well. Actually, if I may say so myself. <laughs> Uh, well, I don't think there are any typical patients. They're all different. That's one of the uh, the joys of medicine. But do you find people coming back for a second take on it? Well, I think one of the advantages in general practice is people do come back, even if they don't specifically come back about the smoking. You do actually see them over time. So you can take the opportunity. That's right. That's right. Do you find people coming back for a second bite and having a think about it? I think if uh, midwives interact with women and we do have some continuity with them in our clinics, then women will come back. And, and if you have been supportive rather than punitive, they will openly discuss it with you again. Raul, uh, we're going to come to this in a moment, the, the sort of tools that GPs and others can use. And Kate was following, following this 5A system, which we'll come back to. How, what's the evidence saying about how you encourage health professionals to actually take these tools up and use them? Well, it's, it's not an easy task. As, as so the cattle prod, but apart from that? <laughs> <laughs> as we know from, from most areas where of medical uh, training and postgraduate training, it's uh, quite uh, a job to change people's uh, clinical behaviour if they've been using the same approach for a long while. But clearly uh, peer, uh, peer training, academic detailing, things like that, having a well-structured program that they can rely on, all of these help, particularly if the GP is motivated to, to do something about the issue, then obviously it can, can fall, fall on fertile ground. Can I just say on that um, note, the National Advisory Group actually um, did a survey, instigated a survey on medical midwifery nursing training as to what was in the curriculum and found that there was very little um, in 2005, 2006 in the, in the curriculums around um, training. So we need to address that as well. Mm. Get it into the mm. system. So tell mm. us about this 5 A's framework. Um. Kate? Well, it's a very useful framework. It's, it's really common sense, but it's a way of remembering the various... C. Pardon? But that's a C. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's a, a way of... A, a framework that, it, that I've found very useful. So it's, first of all, you ask. Mm -hmm. Make sure you actually ask the patient, and that's, that's the first step. Then assess and assess their current um, situation with respect to their smoking. Then you advise them of the benefits of quitting. And then you assist... So do you scare the bejesus out of them or not? Look, I, I, you need to play that by ear um, in the sense that, once again, it depends on the patient. Um, they, I think they, most people know that it's bad for them mm. and it's important that you don't pretend that it's not, so you need to actually tell them, you know, the, the, the facts as it were. But um, I guess depending on the patient, you try and tailor it to what the benefits would be for them personally. Well, I guess you try to tease out of the patient whether they've got some what we call self-exemptions or reasons why it doesn't apply to them. And mm. sometimes you will find patients say things like, oh, well, I know so-and-so who smoke 40 a day and their kids mm. were fine. Or, you know, I, I really want to have a smaller baby. It'll pop out more easily. Yes. And so, so if we can fact, counter yeah. some of those. In fact, we've had a question from rural New South Wales asking about whether fear works as a tactic. What is the evidence on that? I think um, realistic information, uh, rather than calling it fear, definitely works. But uh, if it's over the top, then sometimes people will switch off and walk away from it. But we certainly need to give people, you know, the, the serious facts. So what comes after assess? 
and assess. you have five. So you've done it, ask, yes. assess, assess. Yes. Um, and then you advise them on the benefits of quitting, and then you assist them in some way. And the assistance that you provide really depends on where they are in the, the state of change cycle, which most people I think are now familiar with in terms of pre-contemplation, contemplation, action, maintenance. And um, Although just on that, there's some question of whether that actually works, isn't there, Raoul? Yes, Very trendy, uh, but there, there have work. been some uh, commentators that say that that, that approach has its limitations. On the other hand, there are a number of trials that have used it that mm. seem to have to shown benefits. So it seems to make I think, common sense, I think though, on I think. balance, it's a reasonable framework, mm. as long mm. as you don't get too carried away. No. It's, it's probably just a tool it. to work out where That's the right. person is at. Yeah. That's right. So. It's, trying to, yeah. it's trying to be directive in terms of the... So you're assisting them using the tools that might be available. And then, what's the fifth A? Arrange follow-up, which right. is terribly important. Don't let them go. Yes. And that, once again, will depend on the situation. If you've got somebody who's actually actually um, showing some interest in quitting sooner rather than later. You might even organise to see them the following week. So what tools are available to help the GP out or other health professionals? Well, there are a number of tools available, including this new tool that's become available, the Pregnancy Life Scripts. And uh, this contains a yes. number of things. Yes, <laughs> like what? <laughs> it contains... So it, it goes through just what we're talking about <laughs> yes. here, isn't it? This is the assessment form. That's right. Um, assessment forms, which will help you in your assessment, uh, which is the second day. And then you can uh, score the assessment if you need some assistance with that. That's on the back of that sheet. That's right, on the back of that sheet. Then there's an information sheet, um, which you can use when you're advising the patient about the evidence for, for Right. Benefits of this is quitting. the realistic information that Raoul so delicately put. That's right, that's yeah. right. It's the hard facts. Oh, and here come the five A's. And then there are five A's, and this is a useful reminder of the, the five A's. And lastly, there's actually a pad which um, has a prescription where you can actually recommend specific, specific things for, the, for the, the woman. And also, importantly on that, there's a, a time for follow-up. Have you used this, Sue? Um, it's generally for general practitioners and nurses within practices under the um, guidance of a general practitioner. It wasn't developed for midwives, so isn't generally available for... Right. But this sort of approach has been uh, used in uh, the US and other countries for uh, quite a number of years. So this is really a, an attempt to make it more user-friendly, I think, for mm -hmm. Australian doctors and GPs. It's fairly new, so it's just sort of coming in. Yeah. It's just become available in recent months. And I think uh, one of the key points with any of these programs is that uh, GPs and midwives obviously have to have realistic expectations of success and as many or most of them all know uh, most people that you advise to stop smoking don't on mm -hmm. the first attempt stop mm -hmm. and uh, maybe it's going to make a 10% absolute difference in the quit rate. Now that's very worthwhile in public health terms yes. and in reproductive out outcome terms but um, if someone is expecting maybe to do a lot better, that can be discouraging. Mm. I guess the other thing, sorry, is you also need training around these tools, so you can't just start using them. So midwives and doctors mm. actually need to, some um, education and training around resources. And when do they get that? How do they get that? Well, that's part of the um, national strategy, which was um, developed as a result of the National Advisory right. Group Smoking Pregnancy. Let's go to our third case study, and that's from the National Smoke Free Pregnancy Project, whose national coordinator is Debbie Oak, who's with Kath McKenzie, who's the South Australian Project Officer. Well, my name's Deborah Oak. I'm a midwife, and I'm the coordinator of the National Smoke Free Pregnancy Project. Uh, this project is designed to equip antenatal staff with the resources and the tools to confidently and effectively engage in brief tobacco interventions with pregnant smokers and their partners. There are about 58,000 babies born to mothers who smoke in Australia each year and these babies face a significantly increased risk for perinatal death, very preterm birth and low birth weight and poor lung function and many other problems. 
So I'm the project officer based here at Quit SA and I'm coordinating the South Australian Smoke Free Pregnancy Project. And we are training health professionals on how to have a brief intervention with pregnant women and their partners regarding smoking in pregnancy and how they can assist them to quit. A brief intervention really is that because sometimes when you're working with families in antenatal clinics predominantly... Are you currently smoking? Time is of essence. Asking women, are you a smoker? How many do you smoke? Advising of the benefits of quitting in pregnancy and assisting them to do something about it. So some midwives may spend one minute on it, others may spend five. Coming from a midwifery background, I really felt that this project needed to provide the health professionals with a tool that guides and prompts them through that conversation and core to that was developing the smoke-free assessment and intervention form. What I'm finding is that they are using the ask section really well. The advice section, there is a couple of columns here that have been ticked off. The form is a step-by-step -step guide to prompt and record the conversation that antenatal care providers are having with pregnant smokers and their partners. Did you know some of the benefits to quitting smoking? Yeah, um, I know that. It also prompts the health professional to distribute written resources and to refer women and their partners onto the quit line for the ongoing counselling and support to assist them in their quit attempt. So would you like assistance from Quitline to help you quit those last five cigarettes? Yeah, I'm interested. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be great. I just need you to fill in this form here and then I'll fax that off to them. Okay. And if you can just put in a day and a time that you would like to be called. Then the antenatal care provider faxes that referral off and the Quitline will give her a call. Oh, hello Catherine. It's Bernadette calling from the quit line. Hello, we've re received a referral that you're interested in uh, quitting smoking. Quit line advisors allow as much time as is required by the pregnant woman or her partner to work through the issues that is either wavering them in their quit attempt or preventing them from moving from thinking about quitting to actually right. making a quit attempt. Okay, so I've never really given it a full a full try before. Part of my role is arranging to train anyone who is working with pregnant women. Today's training session is at the Women's and Children's Hospital in Adelaide and we're going to be talking to the midwives on the antenatal ward and I've been allocated an hour to give them some training. A woman's four times more likely to smoke in pregnancy if the partner smokes. Health professionals play a crucial role in the success of this project because they are a respected source of information and support. So that might mean doctors, GPs, midwives, RMOs in the clinical setting and public birthing services, or Aboriginal maternal infant care workers or maternal infant care workers. In the long run, we are looking to have smoking cessation interventions as routine a part of antenatal care as the measurement of blood pressure. Debbie York from the National Smoke Free Project. Sue, what do you think are the main messages from that project? I think the main messages are that midwives are best placed. We know that um, pregnant women are at a stage of motivational change of, of, uh, often and that if we can have a system where we can have some time to sit with women, to discuss it with themselves and partners, then we could have a massive impact on the smoking and pregnancy rates. The comment you made at the end I think was so important yes. that we hopefully it'll become routine 
just mm. like you would not take their blood pressure. You don't get a special you, project for it. No, that's right. Do it. The, the, that's, I think that yeah, last And comment. in fact, the evidence for doing it is better than for many of the other things that we do mm. routinely in pregnancy at present. Mm. I think the issues are that um, it's, it's a very hard subject, that we haven't had the, the skills, training and tools sometimes to provide that education and support for women. Um, and we need to bring it up, as she says, as a blood pressure. It's a routine and that's what the na national approach is about. Mm. And I don't want to demean the, the importance of training. But, I mean, you said it several times now, but um, I mean, surely you can just get on and do it and catch up with the training later. I mean, it is so important. Mm. And the evidence is that if you do something, it's better than nothing. And if you kind of know the tools, and even if you put a woman in touch with the quit line, mm -hmm. you're doing a That's heck right. of a lot. Yes. And midwives do and that quite routinely, yeah. and so do GPs. Yes. What we need is, it, you know, we will always catch Perhaps some not women. not routinely enough, that's the trouble. No. Yeah. And some women will always, you know, get, get into that and ask about it themselves. It's actually the ones that are, you know, the, the harder women to sort mm -hmm. of engage with and to talk to that, that we need to target as well. So we've been doing this work for a very long time. What we need is a bit more support, a bit more time um, and, and maybe some education around, uh, I mean, I've been a midwife for many years and sort of asked the question for 20 odd years. But now, because I've been educated, I can ask it in a way that I believe is much more effective than I've ever been. Right. But what's made the difference? I mean, what, what, how, tell me how you're doing things differently now from before. Um, the difference is that I know instead of, as Raoul said earlier, you know, how do you, do you smoke? I'm asking, how do you feel about smoking? And, and, you know, I understand the stages of change and the ability at which I can interact. And actually, it's also given me permission to say to women, OK, you don't want to give up and not focus my efforts so much on those women, give them the information about quit, etc., but to actually focus on women where, you know, they do You agree need. a bit of movement. Yes. Mm. The quit line referral sheet too is, is quite an important yeah. innovation because that's just one extra uh, string to the bow. And if, if uh, the provider, healthcare provider, hasn't got a lot of time, that's a, a yes. proactive thing. So the patient doesn't have to ring, they mm. get rung. And that's an mm. impor yeah. important component. Mm. Um, sorry, sorry no. unfortunately that doesn't happen for Aboriginal communities though. The quit line is known to be less affected with Aboriginal mm. communities. Mm. That's because it's issue. not an Aboriginal person on the other end of the line. And often they don't have access to phones, mm. etc. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yes. mm. Let's go to our last case study which explores the Mums and Babies program at, again at the Townsville Aboriginal and Islanders Health Service. My name's Kay Thompson. Um, I work at Townsville Aboriginal and Islander Health Service over at the Mums and Babies Clinic as a health worker slash research assistant. But yeah, I haven't smoked since. We have a smoking cessation project going at the moment. It is to help Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, pregnant women, quit smoking during their pregnancy. The smoking cessation project, I think, is important because the rates of um, smoking in pregnancy in Indigenous women is 65% opposed to 20 in non-Indigenous. And while you smoke, it may lead to spontaneous abortion, miscarriage, double the risk of low birth weights and SIDS. <laughs> Leah's been coming to Mums and Babies Clinic since her first pregnancy. Hi Leah, how are you? She came in as a smoker and gave up within the first two weeks. But then she took up smoking again six months post. So how you been? I've been alright. 35 weeks. Any cramping? No. Leah's now coming back to the program with her second pregnancy for her 34 to 36 week survey and antenatal care. Just take a seat down a little bit. Leah's now quit smoking. How are you going today? Oh, Good, you feeling well? Yeah. I know that you cut out smoking, which is great, really well done. Is that still going well? Yeah. Yeah, not smoking? No, no. Yeah, what about your partner and that? Is he? Oh, no, he doesn't smoke, smoke at oh, all. Oh, fantastic. So, yeah, that's a big plus for me. Oh, that's great. And great know, for the baby, isn't is. it? Yeah. Most of the girls are aware what smoking is doing to them, but I don't think they realise what it's doing to their unborn baby. So once we talk to them and make them aware of that, then they sort of feel, oh, 
I didn't realise that cigarette I'm having is affecting my baby as well. There we go, Bob's heart rate sounds good, doesn't it? Nice and healthy. Yeah. They come to the clinic, they see our midwife and the doctor and the doctor will just do okay. a little bit of doing? intervention Good with thanks, them yeah. to see how they're going. As you know that with the smoking there are lots of hazards for the kids and mother both and even if there is passive smoking that the partner is smoking around you you can get a, a, a lot of fumes into your system and it can ha affect your baby. So that's very nice to hear that you don't smoke. <laughs> okay. Then I will see them I'm just constantly talking to the girls. Every time they visit the clinic, I'll approach them. Just a few questions about when you were smoking. How many times did you try before you finally gave up? Uh, probably about yeah, one or two times. A lot of our girls have big families and they have a lot of people living in the same household because you have aunties and extras, so it's a lot of strain on our mums. Plus a lot have um, a few children and the way they feel they can cope with the stress is have a cigarette. We advise the girls to go cold turkey because, you know, cutting back's great, but cold turkey, the more you do it, even if they're smoke free for one day, that's less um, chemicals that are going through their system opposed to cutting back to a half a cigarette or something they're still getting that exposure to the nicotine so we have our posters out there when the girls are recruited we have a lot of brochures and we'll give them stress beads so they feel the urge to have a cigarette well you play with your little beads and we also have available nicotine replacement therapy, plus we provide transport for our clients and that is major. We've got our clients out there that don't have transport, so then they can't get from where they live over to the clinic. And all through the smoking cessation program, we provide little incentives for our girls to keep going they're helping us with our project, so we want to offer them something in return. So and like we're the only trial site like that offers back. incentives. Thank and thank you very much for being part of our study. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the Smoking Cessation Program is a five-year program. It uh, finishes in 2009. But I feel that every day there seems to be a lot more non-smokers coming through our clinic and that may be they're aware that this is a good thing. Claire Thompson in Townsville. That's part of a randomised control trial, isn't it, uh, Sue? Yes, it is. Yeah, it when do the results of that report? I, I when... must admit I'm not sure when they're published. And have the findings so far from, that stu from the study been applied elsewhere from the um, Townsville group? Uh, Professor Sandra Eads is, is working in uh, Western Australia and also New South Wales um, on some of the interventions and bringing in um, some of these interventions for Aboriginal communities here, yes. Well, what's the relative importance of stopping completely versus cutting back? Well, the evidence is pretty clear that stopping completely is much better in terms of public, uh, health benefit to the woman and overall public health benefit. You really have to cut down an awful lot to get a benefit and stay cut down, and that's the other risk that people who cut you down drift can back do. up. Mm -hmm. Drift back up. So quitting completely should be the strongest message. Mm -hmm. So that cold turkey message really should be the primary one. That's right, and mm -hmm. it's ba well backed up by national media campaigns too. Encouraging. Perhaps cold turkey with the nicotine replacement, mm -hmm. but, but actually stopping as yes. opposed to, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. sort of gradually decreasing. Mm -hmm. So in summary then, what do you each think are the significant things that we need to do to have an impact? on reducing Indigenous women smoking in pregnancy and afterwards? Raul? Well, I guess the overall community, there's a, there's a strong supportive environment. Uh, clearly so far that hasn't really impacted too much in Indigenous communities. But uh, we know that uh, a substantial proportion of pregnant women stop smoking before they get to a clinic. For those who get to a clinic, uh, clearly, whether Indigenous or non-Indigenous, then they need additional 
assistance from midwives and doctors and, and, and Sue can perhaps comment particularly on the Indigenous aspects. I think for me as a non-Indigenous person working with Aboriginal people, the, the key elements are that we work in partnership with the community and with the Aboriginal health workers, they're the key. So we need to educate them so that they can work, work, work with us. And the other keys to Aboriginal communities are the elders. So we need to educate the elders so that they can target the young women and support them and create environments. Um, maybe some of the stresses can be dealt with that will enable Aboriginal women particularly to give up smoking during pregnancy. But the other key thing then is because of the high relapse rate is to make sure that that quit attempt then translates long term. The elders have got to quit too. They have, yes. Mm. Kate? Yes. <laughs> yes to the above. <laughs> That's right. I, th I guess the main thing I think is to be aware of the, the problem and to, to ask and follow on. Thank you very much to you all. I hope you've enjoyed this program on smoking and pregnancy. If you're interested in obtaining more information about the issues raised tonight, there are a number of resources available on the Rural Health Education Foundation's website and that's at rhef.com.au. Don't forget to complete and send in your evaluation forms and please register for CBD points by completing the attendance sheet. Our thanks to the Department of Health and Ageing for making the programme possible, but also thanks to you for taking the time to attend and contribute. I'm Norman Swan. I'll see you next time.